Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you all today to the International Journal of Clinical Research. IJCR is an organization rooted with an aim to facilitate and promote high quality research, publication, and interactive content for physicians, educators, and the global medical community. Part of this initiative is the Pioneers in Medicine webinar series. My name is Peter Samuel. I will be your host for today. I am a fifth year medical student from Georgia. I'm currently a member of the Medical Student Advisory Board and the host for the podcast, Medicine Beyond the Science. And now invite Dr. Gregory Nicholas, the managing editor of IJCR, to introduce the journal. Hey, Peter, thank you. Hello, Heba. Hi, Dr. Yeshe. Hello, everyone. I'm going to introduce you a bit about uh, IJCR. I'm going to... We apologize for that. I guess Dr. Greg is having some technical difficulties. Oh, he's no, back. logged out for one second. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Perfect. Okay. So just to say hi to everybody and especially the new members of IGCR, we had a big team and now it grew a lot more for many more countries. Our approach every time it's increasing more, so that's even nicer. And I'm gonna introduce a bit about the International Journal of Clinical Research for everybody who is joining us today. Um, as you guys know, IGCR started as a journal. Our idea was to start as a journal and a nonprofit journal. So it started with an idea to have an open access, but not only free for the author, but also for the reader. That's how it started. We wanted to make an approach so that we can incentivize everybody to publish without having the burden of the money, right? So we waived the fee. So that's how it started. We, we joined seven people and we had this idea. And, and with time, it grew so much that we became very well recognized in many, in many countries. Nowadays, we are in 130 countries, and we have 130 countries publishing in our journal. So that's an amazing news that we have approached after two years of work. And we became a nonprofit organization registered in Delaware, USA. We, we, we were really happy and, and honored that we have a zero article processing charges. So it's a fully free journal. The aim when we started this is to establish equity in the publishing field for both the reader as well as the author, the reader and the authors, for both of them not to have any financial disadvantage. If the reader from a certain country that cannot pay for the article, that's one. And for the author who worked very hard to have that article ready and also for a journal to ask money, I think that is a, a very discouraging and non-incentivizing way that has affected a lot of people through many countries. And that's how we grew so much. We guarantee high quality publications. We have a group of editorials who have been helping us since the start. We have increased the number of editors from many countries, as well as they're incentivizing, whether they're students, residents, uh, professors, everybody to publish and to encourage the free journal. And we have a really good team of peer reviewers and especially statistical review we have uh, by statisticians from many countries and they're handling this part. So everybody in our organization handled certain aspects. And one of the biggest parts we have is to encourage and promote scientific research. If you, if some of you know me and got to know me, I saw videos about me, I always encourage everybody to start publishing early on in their career because it's like surgery. You need to train, you need to have the experience 
so that with time you can become better with your research. The first case report, the first study you're going to publish, it's not going to be good. It's going to be good. It's, it has to become better with time. It's an experience approach. So we encourage young researchers teaching through teaching them, guiding them through the journal, as well as through our activities, through the uh, many activities through the MSAB or other parts of our organization. We have a lot of ways to encourage. One of the biggest ones is this event right now, is that we invite great researchers, great professors to encourage the young uh, generation that research is very important, especially right now. And of course, with every journal, we want to improve patient outcomes and thus optimizing information delivery, especially to developing countries. And this comes through the fact that readers don't need to pay. And this helps them to know how to better treat their patients. This is our ideal way of helping as much as we can. Our scope, we right now, we accept case report, case series, narrative reviews, and original research. We have indexations from ISSN, Google Scholar, Crossref, DOI, Publons. DOAJ, we already got it, PubMed, and Scopus, we're finalizing their indexations this year. As I said, we started in May 2020, nine cities, because back then, in that month, I traveled between Lebanon and Brazil, so it counted as two cities, but it's actually, we were seven people. And in January 2022, we reached 131 countries, and we reached even more right now. In the end of June, we have reached more than 140 countries and 1,607 cities. Our organizing committee of the journal, uh, I'm part of it, Shivangi and Ricardo Villela. Um, we are organizing, of course, without the help of Grace, Carolina, and Rana, nothing would have been done. So I want to thank them. And we've been doing good. We have been having approximately uh, 200 articles per month and all that. So it's going very well. The number of papers being submitted in a very good quality. We are rigorous in the fact of plagiarism and reviewing. But we do help. If you have the will to publish it and you're willing to fix it, we will help you in every step of the way for you to publish this article. The editorial board is a very big editorial board from many countries, but I want to mention and special thanks to Antonio. Antonio is the art director. He's an exceptional artist. If you know him from the Instagram, Lomotet, he has more than 100,000 100, followers. He's a big artist. He's been supporting us since the start, especially with his amazing art. And board of advisors, we have many board of advisors. One of them is Professor Barakat, who's my mentor, who helped me out since the start in many things, not only in research, not only in my residency and work, as also as a person, as a professional person, academic. He taught me a lot, and he's the dean and the provost of the University of Sao Paulo, which is considered the, the largest uh, university hospital complex in Latin America, in the whole Latin America. So, and he's a, an exceptional person. He got very, to be very well known after the technique of the first successful uterine transplant, which led to live birth, uh, first in the world. He has uh, more than 1,500 peer-reviewed articles, H index of 55, a very humble, modest individual who helped and is always willing to help out a lot of people. This is our volume and issue and how we publish it and our design and how we accept it through the indexations. And our divisions through IJCR, as I told you guys, after we became a nonprofit organization, we became a big organization. We have a webinar series, the, which is today with with Dr. Rieshe, which I'm going to be talking about him in a bit and thanking him. Uh, we have the podcast. The, we have a really nice podcast, which Peter right now is running. We have the course, which is the Applied Research Skill course, which is directed by Professor um, Christina Camargo. She is an exceptional surgical researcher who devoted her life for research. She is very well known here in Brazil, as well as in the States, for research. So. We developed a course with her help. We made it even better. We started on our own and we noticed that experience also in teaching comes in a very high value. So she joined us and supporting us with this course. We're finalizing this course as an online platform so that we help everybody and met specific medical schools in going through it. We started it with doing curriculum for specific medical schools with LEU. 
and it's going very well. We are in the second year this year where we teach the students how does research work? How do we upload it? How do review work? How does a journal work and all that? And the biggest chapter that I want to talk in the end is the Medical Student Advisor Board, which is you most probably know about. It's the biggest chapter. I'm going to leave it till the end. The webinar series is directed by Hiba, Kaval, and Peter. So I want to thank you guys. You're doing an amazing job. We have the student committee, Ghazia, Hamza, Abdurraza, Nuf, and Noor. Our divisions. We have the Pioneers in Medicine, that's divided. The webinar series is divided in two things, Pioneers in Medicine, which is acknowledged professors who have done a lot of things in the field. Uh, we're featuring world's premier experts in their respective fields to discuss their research, medical journey, and inspire the next generation in order for them to know the importance of research and how did research help them. The future leaders in medicine is people who are physicians who are early in their career uh, and researchers with great innovative achievements early in their career to discuss their work and share the advice for the upcoming generations. So it's two aspects we see. We see the people who already reached there and how research helped them reach and the future, how they're using research to help them in their career. We have to see these two point of views. We have had an, an amazing uh, flow of run of webinar series with Professor Bruce Chesson from the, uh, the lymphoma research. Uh, he had the criteria, the Chesson criteria for lymphoma treatment the director of, of the Pediatric in Memorial Sloan, Alex Kentis, Robert Peter Gale, who had the uh, Emmy for his book, William O, the CMO of, um, of CIMA4, Patrick Q, the CEO of Moffitt Cancer Center, Razel Kurza, prob probably she is the most published female researcher in the world in the medical field, and Mace Ronsberg, the CMO of Pfizer. So we had an, excessive, an amazing uh, webinar series, and our, one of the future leaders was Grace Armstrong, who is the director of the Ophthalmic Emergency Center uh, in Harvard Medical School. So it's really good, and it's influencing a lot of people. Uh, the podcast, as I said, Peter is doing an amazing podcast. He started right now, continuing after Jake Muldoon, who did an amazing uh, year of podcasts, which influenced a lot of people, charismatic talker. And now Peter, who's also a charismatic talker, which you're going to see now in this, in this event. These are some of the episodes that we've done. We have the Medical Student Advisor Board, which is the biggest chapter in IJCR, and I'm really proud to say, which is the flowing and the fire of IJCR, is the medicine, medical students, and the people who are interested in learning about research. Nancy Emanuel is the advisor, and we have the MSAP Council Presidents, which is Jana Shalbut and Perla Talub. We have the AMSAP Council, the Vice Presidents, Miriam, Elio, Carla, and uh, Mohamed Faizan. Uh, the Executive Count Assistants, we have Rena, Brenda, the Chief Administrators, Leah, and Peter. AMSAP Council, Admissions Officers, Ahmad, Marita, Ala, Fadil, Research Officers, uh, Sara, Mohamed Abbasi, and uh, Mustafa. This is a very interesting part where we give research to medical students who finish the course and we provide them researchers from Brazil, the States, everybody who needs help in research. We have students who graduated research and they're ready to help out because they know all the basics. So this is a nice thing. So we developed this part of the council so that they organize the research. Um, the research opportunities, <laughs> it's funny that I was just talking about. It. Uh, and our, the research opportunity group is a group of students working on writing a scientific article guided by mentors provided by GCR. We have more than 100 students, even more, uh, given the opportunity to participate in research opportunities. We have 34 ongoing research projects, which are active right now, other than the ones that got published. We have 100 medical students, even, I think they increased more than 300 right now, from more than 30 countries. And we have a lot of chapters, Journal Club, Junior Mentors Program, Webinar Series, Digital Health, USMLE, Growth and Development, Social Media Chapter, Hands-on Writing Skills with, with Intersect, the International Student Outreach Chapter, where we have, uh, where we have uh, ambassadors from every country, so that we encourage more research in every country that's participating in IGCR. Uh, I'm not going to go through a lot, but you should join our meetings so that you get to know the different parts. The Journal Club Chapter, where you critique certain articles, you learn how to critique an article, 
with people who are in that field. For example, plastic surgery, I would be invited and I will critique with the students to learn how to critique a plastic surgery research article. The digital health chapter, they talk about the most innovative technology out there, improve the diagnostic management approach, advise the, the, the patient about potential tools that may assist their health. For doctors to get to know them, in, especially graduating doctors, to get to know the new tools that are happening out there. This is very important for research. The webinar series that I talked about, the division between the pioneers in medicine as well as the future leaders, growth and development, we always focus on making a GCR better. So we have a chapter to always make us improve ourselves. We, not only we critique an article, but research affects your life. So you learn how to develop yourself, learn what you need to improve. So we have community building activities, growth and developing workshops for MSAB as well as outside. Social media chapter is, is one of the best parts and I'm thankful for them, uh, Mira and Melanie. They're doing an amazing job in, in joining every information that we have in IGCR and showing it to the public. This is very, very important. And, and one of the things, honestly, I see is that it helps building teamwork, leadership skills, which is very important in IGCR, especially being part of the council. You have to have these skills so that you can lead with a large amount of students. The Intersect, the Intersect is a group where you get to write uh, specific articles, which is the intersection between medicine and non-medicine. It's directed between, by uh, Adam Yunus, who's from Australia, and Reda Saeed, she's in Lebanon right now. The International Student Outreach Chapter, which is the, where we get to get to know more countries about their culture, and we have ambassadors in every country so that we encourage research in all those countries where we do events to encourage research where we talk about EGCR, we talk a certain topic about case report, how to write different articles. So we always encourage people from different countries always to, to start to formulate this activity so that you can affect your peers and you can learn also how to lead this, uh, this activity. The Juniors Mentor Program is a, is a sub-course of the Applied Research. It's only for the MSAB. It's a, a fast workshop that we developed so that students inside the MSAB are ready to do research. And it's directed by Hamna and Abay. We have the US, USMB study group and many more. But I, that's the summary of all of it. We're trying to do as many activities as possible to encourage research, to focus on the fact that research could be free and publication should be free. And so then we encourage everybody in the world to always do research, learn, publish, and help out people. Because when you publish, not only you're doing for your CV, you're helping out the next generation about the important thing, important finding that you, you found, whether it's positive or negative. So this is it. And uh, I want to thank you guys. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to get back to Peter. Thank you, Dr. Gregory, for introducing the journal. I now invite Ms. Hibasati, the director of the Pioneers in Medicine chapter, to introduce a very special speaker for this evening. Thank you so much, Peter. In IDCR, we believe in the free and equitable distribution of knowledge. We also firmly believe that the youth is our future, and it is directly intertwined with research innovations. Therefore, we launched the webinar series, an initiative where we bring to you medicine's most prominent luminaries, discussing their medical journey, research discoveries, and passions in hope that it will inspire you. However, our success cannot be achieved without a great team. And I am fortunate to have a passionate, hardworking, and dedicated team to make this event a reality. Today, we are very excited to host one of the most prominent neurologists and researchers, Dr. Naji Riachi. Dr. Naji Riachi is a consultant neurologist at Sheikh Shahboud Medical City and the clerical director of neurology at Khalifa University College of Medicine in Abu Dhabi. Dr. Riachi has served as a full professor and chair of the Department of Neurology at the Lebanese American University, LAU. He was also the assistant dean of clinical research at the LAU School of Medicine. He is the founding member of the Lebanese League Against Epilepsy and built the neurology program at Risk Hospital in Lebanon. Having more than 24 years of experience in neurology, he has secured several grants to conduct his own research work, which has lately been focused on neurostimulation and investigating diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Dr. Riachi has a busy outpatient practice with over 24,000 patients, yet he has remained very involved in teaching 
and mentoring medical students, residents, and fellows. He has, involved in several, he has been involved in several clinical studies and has given more than 300 lectures, both regional and international. In addition to many merits, he is also an editorial board member of several leading journals and the author of many peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. We thank you for joining in with us today, Dr. Naji Riyachi. The floor is yours. Before Dr. Yoshi, I just want to thank Dr. Yoshi for being with us and uh, I'm still presenting. I just noticed my screen is still presenting. <laughs> and I want to say to everybody that Dr. Yoshi was actually my professor and I'm honored to have him here. And I was honored and fortunate to learn from him a lot. He is one of the most, best to teach neurology and I'm very thankful for you being here with us, Dr. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Hiba, for this uh, introduction. Um, I have a huge head like this. I don't know how I'm going to be able to walk through the door and finish the presentation. I don't think I deserve all of this. Um, I'm humbled and I'm very honored to give this presentation today. When uh, Greg, Hiba, Peter and the team told me about how these uh, presentations are being done, I started thinking, what am I going to say that will be out of the box? I mean, I could have presented uh, my expertise in a certain topic, but I didn't think that I would be able to reach uh, the majority of the people who are not necessarily neurologists, and I wanted uh, a team that would interest everybody. So um, I thought best to, to talk about my journey uh, with neurology over the years, uh, how I uh, uh, gained my uh, expertise uh, and how it was uh, all guided at the same time by clinical approach and by research at the same time because I'm, I'm, um, I've been bitten by the research virus and by the teaching. So I, I cannot do without those two in my life. And it has been uh, quite a course, especially that... Uh, uh, neurology has progressed and neuroscience has progressed so much over the past uh, few years that, uh, as you're going to see, uh, we have lived some uh, exciting times. So, Hiba, please, if you can start sharing the screen with everyone. Okay. So, uh, as was mentioned, I'm currently a consultant uh, at Sheikh Shahboot Medical uh, City in collaboration with Mayo Clinics. And I'm also the Clarship Director of Neurology and the Assistant Dean for Clinical Affairs at Khalifa University. Next slide. So, why neurology? Uh, when I was fresh out of medical school, I wanted to uh, understand intelligence. Uh, look at how stupid I was. I thought that it was if I were to go into neurology, that would help me understand intelligent and how does does the brain function and with time we've learned that the more we know the more we don't know and uh, it's been extremely exciting to work through it uh, like this so a very good friend of mine came to me and he said neurologists are prima donna and you are a very practical person so why would you go into something into a field like this why don't you pick another field uh, all you do is diagnose patients, all you care about is localized lesions, and then what? You have very little therapy to offer, there is very little thing you can do for the patient. So why would somebody like you who has a practical hands-on approach would be interested in something like this, which is really uh, masturbation of the brain and, and nothing more than that? So next slide, please. Um, so when i went to case western reserve as a fourth year medical student for my electives i had the honor of meeting dr foley joseph foley who was the attending uh, during that month that i spent there dr foley by at that time was already an emeritus professor of neurology and he remained there for an extra 10 12 years uh, he's an extraordinary physician he was the chairman of neurology at case western and he was one of the rare ones to be the president of the American Academy of Neurology as well as the American Neurological Association. And there are a handful of people that have uh, uh, become the president of both associations. One of his mottos was make sure you love people and behave in a way that you can be loved. And I think that this is a really nice motto for everyone to try to apply. 
uh, Dr. Foley was an amazing individual. He kept coming to Grand Rounds, even though towards the end of the, his life he was completely blind with the uh, degeneration of his retina. They would guide him in, but he was extremely sharp. He would ask the most astute questions, make the perfect comments, and do it not just not to show up at all, but to teach. His aim was to teach. And when he was asked that uh, what what is the best aspect of your of your career he answered the people of uh, i trained and he was an amazing individual because he was patient centered he was not problem centered and he would tell us that even if the disease is not curable you can still treat the patient you can still offer support to the family this is part of your job and the neurologist has to go through this because otherwise he would fail as a as a physician and he would fail more importantly as a human being and so uh, he would not only give you the 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 history of uh, behind a sign he would go into the details of explaining and how it got there and what was done to make it you know uh, uh, reach that point he wiped up every single doubt i had about becoming a neurologist. So I came back home and I was really convinced that this is what I wanted to do. Next slide, please. I was really lucky to have a bunch. Next slide, Hiba. I think Hiba froze on us. Next slide, Hiba, please. Okay. No, the, the one before, we skipped one. Okay. And then my, my next mentor was uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Daroff. He was uh, the chairman of the department at Case Western that I was uh, lucky to join quite a few years later because my, my career was a bit atypical. So I went through medical school into research. I did a f what, hap what ended up being a four years uh, postdoctoral fellowship. And then I went back to clinical medicine and did my residency in neurology. But when I became uh, a resident, uh, Robert Bob Daroff was the chair of, uh, of the university. And he was also the editor, in the, the editor in chief of the journal uh, Neurology and the president of the American Neurological Association and the president of the American Headache Society. And he was an extraordinarily good physician, uh, especially known in uh, uh, neuro-ophthalmology. We had a very strong uh, department with that at, at uh, the university. And uh, he also was renowned for headaches. We had a, cl a clinic on Wednesday that dealt only with headaches and with myasthenia. So we had several different poles of interest and that also appealed to me so i figured if you can if you are a good neurologist you don't need to be good in one thing only you can you can multitask if you like it i mean if you have several fields of interest you can pursue them all and that was uh, uh, really extremely uh, interesting and Darov had this thing that he had this fatherly approach where he did not want to have one chief resident we were, we were seven residents per year in the program and we were all considered chief resident and he would call upon each one of us whenever he would need uh, him or her to do particular tasks and i will never forget that he called on me one day to solve a very difficult problem and i said why me and he said because of your communication skills and i was getting to be known then as as a as a good uh, speaker and as somebody who can uh, who can find solutions and that started making me think that you know there is something that is that is ongoing that i'm not even aware of because to me it, it came flawless without without trying to to push it or anything like this but you know with time you you learn to start recognizing your attributes and if you are smart enough you will develop them and then you can you can go very far very far with that but again when when Daraf was asked what he was the most proud of he said I trained a lot of very bright people. I hope it will be said that I was a good teacher. So again, that teacher, that teacher, that teaching thing started to become ingrained in me. And uh, uh, I hope to have uh, been able to carry the torch along. Next, please. And then finally, uh, I have to introduce Dr. Sami Harik, who, who was the professor of neurology and the professor of uh, uh, oncology as well. Sammy was the vice chair of the neurology department when I rotated at Case Western and then he went on to Arkansas to become, be, become the 
chairman of neurology. He was the secretary of the American Academy of Neurology and the vice editor of neurology. And Sammy was my mentor. He is the one who taught me everything I know about research, about clinical neurology. I mean, a lot of things I owe Sammy a lot. He was like a father image to me at, at one point in time as well. When I needed help uh, leaving Lebanon during the war uh, with very little support, he was there for me every single step of the way. And he was an extremely interesting individual because uh, people would say that he would shoot from under the belt. So he was really quick, quick to fire, and he was almost, almost always right, which, which tickled uh, a few people in a very negative way. But I mean, it was his way of, of sorting things. And Sammy would say that if you don't have your diagnosis uh, after your history taking in 80% or so of the cases in neurology, you'll never get the diagnosis right. So his approach was if you don't have a good history, you're not going to be able to interpret your exam well, and you should expect from a good history what you're going to find on the exam and not the contrary. So if you're going into an exam blinded, you're going to be really in, in deep hot waters. And if you're not going to take a good history properly, you're not going to be able to, to reach the diagnosis. And he taught me the art of taking a good history. Uh, I worked with him in research for four years, and we worked on a bunch of interesting projects, as you will see in a minute. He was very well known for the glucose transporter of the human brain, and also his work on the blood-brain barrier is, is notorious. Sammy has published, I think, now more than 500 uh, articles and uh, a, a number of books. And he's remained uh, uh, a, a friend uh, uh, with, with all of this. I thought that it was important to start this lecture by recognizing my mentors and by telling you how they influenced my career uh, uh, over the years. Next slide, please. So from 90, I graduated from AUB with my MD in 1986. And then I went, as I told you, to, the, to, to Cleveland to work with Sammy that I did not know. I met him during the elective that uh, I spent there with Dr. Foley. He was away on vacation, and then he came back in the middle of it, and uh, uh, Foley introduced us. And it so happened that one of the fellows working with him, you know, at the time there was no WhatsApp, no no emails, no nothing. So uh, when, when we would go, we would carry letters and we would carry items and we'd carry stuff for friends because especially in Lebanon, we were very remotely isolated from the rest of the world with the war and the communication was really rudimentary. So uh, I got uh, uh, to meet Dr. Mferrej, who was doing his neurosurgery at the Cleveland Clinic. And as part of his training, he had to come to the lab to work with Sami for a year. And this is how I got introduced to the lab. And I thought, ha, ah, this is interesting. This is what I want to do. So I went back to Dr. Harik and I asked him if he had a position for me for the following year. And he thought that I was going to use this as a, you know, boarding thing to, to get into a neurology residency. And he was very hesitant at first. He did not want to take me. And I said, listen, I'm going to do research and I'm going to do it at your lab or at any other lab. So I just need to know if you have a position for me, because if not, I'll go look something somewhere else. But I was interested in your lab because it had a multiple of interest. It was a neurosurgery neurology lab open together. So we would do stroke, stroke stri uh, slices. We would do uh, in vivo, we would do in vitro. We would do blood brain barrier. We would do glucose transporter with a bunch of people that were very well known in the field at that time. And then he looked at me and said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll take you. And this is how I got the opportunity to work with fantastic people like uh, David Last, Joel Amana, Rajit Galeria, who are all, who were all, you know, professors in their field at the time I got there. And when I first got to the lab, uh, Sammy told me that we have a bunch of things going in the lab, as you were able to notice. We have the, the dementia project that is running well under Raj Galeria. You could join with, with him. We have the uh, uh, glucose transporter and the cerebral blood flow that is working very well under Lamana. And then we have the stroke, which is working well under Dave Lust. And we have one project that two postdoctoral fellows broke their teeth and were not able to get any data uh, with. 
and that's the MPTP. And of course, that's the one that I had to pick because I did not want to pick a project that was already up and running. I wanted to pick something that I would be able to uh, help develop myself. And so uh, uh, I started by, uh, I have an OCD nature traits, not really, I'm not OCD, but I have o OCD traits. So I got to the lab and I'm, I, you know, I was fresh out of medicine. I knew nothing about research and I started to read, 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 read and read more and read more. And, and then I was like, what am I going to be able to do here? And I, um, I, I had to clean the lab before I start to work. And then by mistake, I, I just took a swab and I found radioactive tracing. And I'm like, boy, the, the people that worked here before me must have really been sloppy. So I purged uh, the HPLC machines. I, I, I did everything I could to get a, a fresh start. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at all of these bottles of ingredients. And, and I had a, a light bulb uh, into my brain. I'm like, no. I cannot use this. If if two people before me were not able to get any data, and it should be very simple. I mean, it's a it's a solution that you prepare, and you know, if you're good, you you do it the right way. And then if you purge your machine, you have to be able to get the the different elements. Why why were they not be able to do it? And so when Sammy came to the lab, I told him how much would all of this cost to replace, and he said, why? I said. Just a question. I want to know, is it a couple of hundred of bucks or is it going to be a million dollars? I need to know what, what it would cost. And he looked at me and like, you son of a gun. Now I know what you're doing. He said, okay, you can replace everything. And I went in and I swapped everything into a garbage bag, got new ingredients. And the, to make a long story short, six months later, I had the results of my first experiment and I published my first paper. And that, you know, um, was an extremely good time for me because uh, you know when you're fresh out of medical school coming out of lebanon you want to gain in confidence and in assertiveness and that experience in the lab helped me achieve that much i was very curious i wanted to touch upon everything and i developed a bunch of new techniques to the, in the lab so i worked on uh, mptp uh, and uh, my interest why, why are rats resistant to it when man and monkey are very sensitive? And that led us to discoveries about the blood-brain barrier being rich in MAO inhibitors that would break down the MPTP before it reaches the brain to, to, to produce its toxic effects uh, in man and in monkeys because their blood-brain barrier was very deficient of in MAO whereas uh, rats had very high uh, contents. So we, I worked on a bunch of these things. I went to, uh, um, uh, to Hopkins, learned how to use microsphere, brought that back to the lab. I, I would do uh, internal carotid administration at, at MPTP, and I was extremely good with my hands. I would do the setup and, and cannulate the, the, the carotid, Greg, in, 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 one, in one minute, whereas the others would, would still be waiting. So they asked me, why don't you do neurosurgery since you're that good with your hands? And I said, unfortunately, I had very poor mentors in neurosurgery, unlike the ones I had in neurology. So this is why I went into, into neurology and not neurosurgery. But I mean, it, it's interesting. Uh, uh, we did in vivo work. We did in vitro work. We, I, I, I did a lot of things. And this all led, next slide, Hiba to these publications uh, out of the lab in those uh, four years that I spent with Sami. And he taught me another thing. He said, never prostitute science. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, look at the papers that are being published right and left. Each one of them is not worthy in and by itself to be published. It has to be a complete story. It has to be flowing it has to have a, a subject matter it has to to be developed and i said yeah you mean that every paper of ours is equivalent to five or six or maybe even ten papers of the others and this is not fair to us and he would start laughing and say never prostitute science again and so when came time for me to do my first presentation you know in the lab we used to have meetings every couple of weeks but before meetings we would meet every week and we would you know, prepare our presentation and present it to the group to get criticized by them to be ready before we would go and confront uh, uh, other people. And uh, he looked, he sat in his corner and I saw him, you know, looking at me and he didn't say anything until the end. And then when everybody was done, he said, 
Well, this was a good presentation, Rieshe, but I'm going to teach you now how to make a sexy presentation. And he sat with me and he nailed me. I mean, he gave it to me. And then I started following his advices and that has helped me a lot hugely over the years in, in the preparations that I've pre uh, in the presentation that I, I have done. A, a presentation can be good, but if it's not sexy, you're going to lose the audience through uh, half of the audience uh, through half of it. So he taught me how to do it in a way. He said, if you have strong data and if you if the people believe your premises to start with, you can take them to the moon and bring them back during a presentation. And he was right. I mean, if 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 you are lucky enough to have solid data and you're a good uh, presenter, you can you can do great things. Next slide, um, Hiba. And then I started my residency from 1990 to 1994. Sammy wanted me to go to Cornell. I went and interviewed at Cornell, and I did not quite get along with the uh, with Fred Plum, who was then. Uh, the head of the Cornell residency. And I told Sammy, this is not for me. And he said, why? I said, before the end of this residency, a residency, I'm gonna either become homicidal or suicidal. I, I, I'm not gonna, I, 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 I'm not made for this. I know myself, I will not be able to put up with, uh, with, uh, with what uh, is going on there. And I don't want to go to, to Cornell. I want to stay here in Cleveland because I'll still be able to access the lab and I will be able to run research at the same time that I'm doing my residency. And he said, but you, you already know the system here. I said, I know the researchers. I don't know any of the clinicians. And God knows you have tons of them that are excellent. So I'm not going to leave. So I stayed and I had the opportunity to work with superb individuals. Foley that I mentioned before, Bob Ruff, uh, Michael Devereaux from the right end of the screen towards the left. Jim Schmidley, these were the, the SAGE, you know, the people that you'd go to with any problem and they would give you answers. And then David Riley, Movement Disorder, who taught me how to do Botox injections in cervical dystonia, Kriegler with headaches, Bernd Remler, who was a neuro-ophthalmologist, together with Lee next to him and uh, Bob Deroff, and then uh, an ophthalmologist called uh, Tom Sack. We had a, a superb neuro uh, we, we had the the, the best neuro-ophthalmology department of the whole U.S. Bash Katerji, who told me everything I know about um, neuromuscular EMG, etc. And then Dennis Landis, with whom we were doing uh, a study then at the time of intracarotid TPA injections for treatment of stroke. This was a research that was run by NIH. It did not prove to be more helpful at the contrary than the intravenous that we are, are now using. But the first time I injected intracarotid uh, TPA into a, a person that presented with a deep uh, right hemiparesis with, a, with, a, with aphasia and he went out of the room able to talk and move, we were, I mean, we were completely elated and we were jumping up and down like we were given a million dollars each. I've done that with my uh, colleague at work, uh, Dr. Cindy Bamford, and we were really impressed with, with, with what, went, what went on. During that neurology residency, we were lucky enough to get some treatments that became available. The first triptan, sumatriptan, became available then. The first interferon to treat multiple sclerosis became available then. New anti-epileptic medications, felbamate, gabapentin, lamotrigine, became available then. And we were also using uh, uh, quite a bit of Botox. It was not uh, stolen by the plasticians. Uh, uh, Greg yet. It was still uh, purely neurology that was using it. And we were using it in dystonia, in uh, in blepharospasm, in uh, hemifacial spasm, in, in stroke patients, uh, all of those goodies. Uh, uh, and we were, uh, later on, we developed the use of it in, in migraine headaches. But, uh, but since then, it has gotten its uh, fame and uh, uh, with the hands of our uh, friends, the plasticians. Next slide, please. After my uh, residency at the clinic, I was very lucky indeed to, to be able to start a fellowship in epilepsy and clinical uh, neurophysiology at the Cleveland Clinics under the guidance of Dr. Hans uh, Luders. And um, even though they called me the, the deserter and the traitor at the uh, university, they were really happy to see me uh, go there because for maybe nine years in a row, the Cleveland Clinic had not accepted any applicant into the program. And I think that I helped my luck 
because I took, took a month of elective uh, during my residency and went and spent it at the Cleveland Clinic. And I was lucky that Dr. Luders was the attending during that month when I was there, I mean, two weeks of the month. And I was um, stupid enough to contradict him on one case that we were presenting at bedside with the, uh, with the chief resident, uh, Dr. Andrew Liesel, a guy that uh, is from Australia that I, that I still uh, like a lot now. But anyways, they were discussing the case and I said, no, I don't believe this to be the case. And they looked at me in a strange way and they said, what do you mean? I said, I gave them my theory and they said, so, so Luders hand me the hammer and he says, please illustrate. And I'm examining the patient and I'm talking as I'm doing it. And, and you know, this is one of my habits. I, I always talk out loud and explain what I'm doing. And then at the end of the, my demonstration, uh, Luders turned his back and left. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I think I ruined every potential chance that was already dismal to get into the Cleveland Clinic. The next day I got there and uh, Andrew looks at me and says, the big boss wants, who, wants you in his office now. I'm like, oh Jesus, what the, why, did I, why didn't I keep my big mouth shut for once? I, I could have done it. I mean, why did I have to say anything? And so I went into the office and Dr. Luder started asking me questions about my research and what et cetera that I'm doing. And why don't I present at the neuroscience day that, of the Cleveland Clinic? And I said, what neuroscience day? I'm not aware of it. And he said, of course, you guys at University Hospital don't give us any credits. You don't come to our... I said, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I, I, I did not know about it. So tell me about it. And he said, you know, if you were to present, you, have, you would belong to the junior uh, researchers because you're young. And we have junior and senior researchers, and that the, the the faculty here will get to to know will get to know you better. And who knows what this would lead to? And I said, of course, I have a project that I just finished, and it was the last one that I've done during my PGY2 neurology, which is really tough to do because you're on call every third. You're covering three hospitals. You're covering two an inpatient and the consult team in each one of the hospital. You have longitudinal clinics ongoing in the three hospitals at the same time. So we were extremely busy and we learned by baptism of fire, really, that the number of cases, the number of admissions that we would have every day was unbelievable. But I was able still to get some research done and I just was about to send a patient a paper for publication and it was the last one that I've worked on I developed uh, fluorinated analogs of MPTP and my aim was to be able to run them through PET scan in monkeys to be able to understand the physiology of it better. And unfortunately, I, I was not able to pursue this any further because then I got into other other things and I wasn't I had no access anymore to, to, to the lab. But um, I won first prize in that neuroscience day and and I think that was my ticket to the Cleveland Clinic for my for my epilepsy uh, training with them. And it was an extremely interesting time uh, with Holly Morris, uh, uh, Burgers, uh, Suhail Noachtar, Prakash Kotakal, and Elaine Wiley that you see pictures of on the, on the slide. They taught me a lot. And then during that time, we had this surge in the medications that became available, as you can see on your, on your uh, screen here in the cartoon and some of them became not available when felbamate was taken out of the market because of hepatic toxicity who happened to be the senior uh, epilepsy fellow on call yours truly and i was flooded with calls i mean the clinic said call this number if you want extra information and i i mean i did not get one minute of sleep for 72 hours slate because I was hammered with phone calls. So I got there on the Monday morning and I said, I need half a day off, guys. Just take it, <laughs> take this beeper away from me and give me and give me a, a short break. And it was it was interesting because, uh, you know, um, it, it was a, 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 a fellowship where I learned a lot. Uh, we did we did a lot of surgery and we did a lot of semiology, which I love. So our day would start with, with Dr. Luder showing us videos of epilepsy. We needed to discuss what we were seeing. We needed to classify the, the seizure according to his semiology classification that he published right a year later. Uh, and, uh, and it was finally accepted by, by the League Against Epilepsy because it was extremely helpful compared to the old one that was not at all. 
And then we need to make sure that the semiology match with the EEG, that the EEG match with the MRI, that the MRI match with the other lateralizing features before we would send the patient to surgery. And we would do this in something that we call epilepsy rounds. And when it didn't, we would do more invasive surgery, open craniotomy, et cetera, to, and then uh, simulation of the brain and all of that. So we were a manufacturing. We had, when I started, we had 12 adults and five pediatrics bed. When I left, we were up to 24 adults and I think 12 uh, pediatric beds. And it was unbelievable. I mean, we were like running like, you know, a patient a day uh, almost. Uh, and so it was an excellent uh, experience for me. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I then sat down and watched neurosciences jump into the future. And it was an amazing, amazing thing that happened. So um, neuroscience, you know, had been practiced since the ancient civilization and the brain was considered to be the source of intelligence since the late ages, as early as the sixth century before Christ. But then modern neuroscience has seen a dramatic resurgence within the last 20 to 30 years with many major discovery about the function, the role, the different neurological diseases, the anatomy, the localization, the tracks, and now lately, the how the areas talk to each other to perform a certain task. And this is unbelievable data that I'm gonna to present to you in a little bit. So we, we, we learned a lot more about how the brain functions during the past 20 years than over the all of the decades that followed. So much so that Michael Stryker, a neuroscientist at US, UCSF, an excellent one, said, I feel really sorry for the people who retired five years ago. Neuroscience now is a completely different world from how it used to be. And he said that at the turn of the century. So he also mentions that the brain has zillions and zillions of neurons. And it only works because they're connected together in the right way. Each neuron talks to, talks to the right other neuron and tells them something, and other neurons process the information further and end up allowing us to make decisions and do actions. And I think this summarizes it in, in a couple of words, in a couple of words, how, how things uh, were meant to be. Next slide, please. So in the last 20 years, we have seen some really am amazing groundbreaking discoveries in neuroscience. First of all, we've identified single gene defects that contribute to neurological disorders. Now we understand much better how the brain reacts to social stimuli. And we have also discovered that the brain is plastic. I mean, it's still, it's still able to develop and it's very malleable even into adulthood when you used to think that this is not true. Brain computer interfaces with direct communication between the brain and some external devices were also developed which allowed us to understand a lot more about uh, behavioral neurology than what we were able to do before. We discovered how memories are formed, we discovered how they are accessed, we discovered how they are stored, and we are also discovering uh, the role of glial cells in key brain functions when before we used to consider them to be sitting there just for the decor. Next slide, please. So, some advances that were made that I'm going to be discussing further is the development of neural implants for degenerative eye conditions, uh, exploration of implantable therapies for Parkinson, for epilepsy, for addiction, for chronic pain, and then the human genome, which was sequenced and mapped in 2001. There is an NIH blueprint for neuroscience research that was created in 2004. And then there is the brain, which is the, the, the diminutive for Brain Research to Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies that was created in 2013 to help in is to understand disorders like Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's, depression, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So neurogenetics was when the paradigm shifted, and this was all made uh, become possible uh, with the human genome. And this was a new concept and we were able to sequence the human genome and it was first announced by two groups, uh, Francis Collins at the uh, National Institute of Health and uh, 
inventor of Celera Genomics. And this project was huge and it was sponsored by both Bill Clinton and the Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair in, Lin in London, England. And the initial sequences of the research were published at one day interval, February 15 and 16, 2001, by those two groups, the Collins and the Venter uh, groups that we've mentioned before. And the number of protein encoding, uh, encoding transcripts or genes in the human genome were about 30,000, which is much less than we previously predicted. And they did, did that by sequencing DNA from five individuals, three males and two females, one African, one Chinese, one Hispanic Mexican, and two European. And so this is how it all started. Next slide, please. So genomics in medicine, what did it allow us to do? Well, new technologies were developed. One of them is called NGS, which is the next generation sequencing. The other one is, is called GWAS, which is the Genome-Wide Association Studies. And all of this has helped us identify gene mutations which are believed to be behind complex neurological diseases, such as Alzheimer, Parkinson's, ALS, multiple psychiatric disorders, and to understand many of the neurological pathologies which we had no clue about up until this, this point, to, to, to understand the interplay between heritable and non-heritable mutations and epigenetics, and other factors that were revealed through these techniques mentioned above. Next slide, please. So how did we bring it from research to practice? Well, you imagine that it would not have been able, it would not have been possible to continue to use uh, genomics if we wanted to use them the old way. It cost about three billion dollars to make the first, you know, genomic uh, map, and it took more than a decade to finish from 1990 to 2001. With time, now the entire genome can be sequenced commercially in a day or less for much less than $1,000. I think now for $500 or $600, you can get it done. So these genome sequences are now guiding our approach to different conditions, whether it be in the diagnosis, in the prognosis, or in the management of these conditions. Next slide, please. And so we have developed something called gene therapy, and now we have also monoclonal antibody therapy, which are really revolutionizing neurology and treatment of patients. So uh, as, as a start, we have a primitive bacterial adaptive immune system that was discovered in 2012 using the techniques mentioned above. And then systems that can be engineered to edit nearly any genomic region. So we can do cut and paste to modify the genomes. And by doing so, we can treat or stop the progression of certain diseases. Next slide, please. So these are the example of gene therapy that we have in different clinical trials. We have, I'm not going to read them and bore you with them, but you can look at them. And, uh, and all of these, the genes were isolated and we are able now to provide gene therapy to these patients, whereas before we really had nothing to offer them. And I don't know if you can imagine the impact of this. When, we, when I went to an American Academy of Neurology meeting uh, some maybe eight years ago or so and was shown the result of the first gene therapy on a disease that was untreatable, incurable, uh, leading to death within a couple of years. And we saw patients walking again, functioning normally, etc. It was so gratifying and uh, we were so humbled. Next slide, please. Other uh, neuroscience discoveries were done using, you're not going to believe it, but using mice, because we were able to create um, a human brain network in living mice, so we were able to, to study a live human between code brain in a brain of a mice. Because we before, uh, this was helped us to progress a lot, because before all of the studies used, uh, used to uh, either be performed on uh, post-mortem people, uh, biopsies, etc., or passive observation of living subjects, but we could not do really uh, procedures that would impair these patients or make them, you know, become uh, uh, affected in one way or the other, and now we had the possibility to do it. Next slide, please. And these are some of the, this and, and the next slide will cover some of the inventions that we were able to, to, uh, to 
get to using that model, uh, microglia, uh, how the brain responds in Alzheimer, traumatic brain injury, stroke, Parkinson's, uh, activate the, the visual cortex to trigger hallucinations, the insight into hallucination causing mental illness like schizophrenia, Alzheimer, Lewy body disease, bipolar disorder, I mean, genetic defects with human glial cells, uh, which are important in schizophrenia, other brain disorders. You know, you name it, you have it. It was, it was an extremely important, next slide please, Hiba. Extremely important uh, 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 discovery. And here uh, we continue, we were able to, to develop uh, neurotoxic drugs that would kill glioblastoma cells in mice without injuring healthy cells by using these produce this was as this came out of Sloan Catherine uh, brain tumor center we understand the 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 relationship between the buildup of amylose and Alzheimer's disease so this is a potential Alzheimer's treatment and a lot of studies are being done on that and hopefully soon we will have more positive results than the one we've seen uh, so far I mean uh, the link between exercise and cognition uh, all of these uh, were uh, very, very important uh, discoveries that we've made using this MICE model. Next slide, please. What do you think that is? Some of you, the ones who know me well, know that I have an interest in art. And so maybe this is a collection of some artsy paintings that I put together for you. Do you think that is what I've done? Well, I would have liked to do it, but that's not the case. But Imagine that these are all pictures of the brain that were published by Harvard University when the Human Connectome Project came into play. I mean, these beautiful pictures are coming from our brain. Next slide, please. And this is why I want to talk about the Human Connectome uh, uh, System, which was something that was built to help understand the brain structural connectivity and it's the project started in 2009 and the purpose of this is to build a network map to shed light on not just the anatomical and and uh, and track system of the brain but to understand the functional connectivity with healthy human brain what do we mean by functional connectivity when you are asked to think about a project or um, move or dance, etc., it, we don't only understand what tracks and what cells are being involved, but we know how they talk to each other during the event. And to be able to do that, they had to develop three MRIs. Each one of them had the power of a subnuclear submarine, of a nuclear submarine, to be able to track these and to be able to get them. And when this data was presented to us at one of the American Academy of Neurology meeting a few years ago, I was sitting in among the audience and I had to pinch myself to make sure that I was awake and that, that this was reality and that I was not sitting through a, through a Star Trek uh, episode. Because, I mean, this was completely surreal at the time and it was amazing, amazing to see how this was developed further and to produce uh, the images that you saw on the, on the previous slide. Next slide, please. And then in the middle of this, I decided once I was done with my fellowship and had gotten my two boards from the United States and my American citizenship, I decided on a whimsical decision. And I don't know what, what um, people still ask me up to this day, why did you ever go back to Lebanon? You had your career lined up for you as a researcher, academician, etc., in the US. And why did you go back to Lebanon? And why did you go to a private hospital in Lebanon, not to, to AUB or to a, another place like this? Well, those of you that know me know that I love the challenges. And uh, I was given a, a, a challenge to create uh, neurology, neurophysiology, etc., at this hospital. And we were a bunch of idiots or crazy people that were trying to transform this hospital into an academic teaching institution. And we invested a lot of time of effort doing that. And finally, we were able to succeed. So I got there uh, and Dr. Asad Rizal, whom you see a picture of on the screen, uh, said to me during an interview, I, I, he called me to the US and he said, when are you coming to Lebanon? I didn't know him. I, I knew his sons. We, they were classmates at uh, during school. 
So he said, when are you coming back to Lebanon? I said, why? I'm coming this uh, in, in a couple of weeks for Christmas. And he said, I need you to give me an appointment from now because I know that when you'll come here, you'll be very busy and we'll not find. I need you to clear your, your time for a couple of hours to come and visit with me at the hospital. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come. And so when I walked in, he had done his research, obviously, and he said, I want you to join my team. So what is it going to take? And I'm like, I looked at him and I'm like, is this guy crazy? I mean, I, I, he must have, you know, I mean, he must have come from another planet or something. What, what? I said, what do you know about me? He says, everything I need. And I said, okay, so what, what, is, what does that mean? I, 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 and he, he started to mention some attributes that I had uh, uh, in my career and, and what I could do for him, etc. And I look at him and I'm like, wow, this guy has, uh, has a huge vision for this place. And if, if he's willing to put his uh, money where his mouth is, maybe we, can, maybe we can do something. And I said, well, you're, good. you're gonna need to buy me all of this equipment. And he looks at me and he said, average cost of all of this. And I gave him the figure and he signed and he said, okay, that's, that's it. You go, you go find the dealers. I'm not gonna deal with international dealers. I want dealers that are based in Lebanon because that's how I function. I'll send you the name of all the people I work with, and if you're not happy with them, you let me know. And then this is how it all started. And six months later, I was I was back in Lebanon and working with them, and I uh, uh, I couldn't believe that I, I I was there. But I had a very good time at, at the hospital. I have to admit, uh, I created the the neurophysiology labs. I opened the uh, the epilepsy monitoring unit. At the time, there was only one, which was at AUB. And Dr. Muhammad Miati and myself collaborated to uh, add the, the uh, monitoring to the to the protocol and to make it acknowledged by the Ministry of Health and the uh, Social Security and all of that. And I was one of the founding members of the Lebanese League Against Epilepsy. I went to uh, Buenos Aires to register the, the league with the International League Against Epilepsy. And I developed the neurology residency program of the Lebanese University. Uh, I started teaching medical students from day one when I got there, and uh, and I kept on developing that trend. And then um, I was uh, asked to be part of the committee of the residency, and they used to have a very funny way to do it. They would ask people to do a full internal medicine residency, and then they would spend only two years in neurology. And uh, we managed to reverse that and got the governmental decree, you know, everything at the Lebanese University had to get a, a government decree that has to be signed by the prime minister and it has to be approved by the parliament, etc. To change that to one year of internal medicine and then four years of neurology instead of three because we wanted them to go abroad to get exposed to more things uh, before they would graduate. And so this was a, a big chunk of my uh, my career, I became the head of the executive committee of the hospital for a short period of time. I was chair of uh, internal medicine as well. Uh, but I had a good time because I developed it from scratch. The first EEG that I've done at the hospital, I had to play the technician and put the electrodes on the on the patient myself. And then I trained my, my technician who stayed with me up until I left Lebanon. Uh, and she trained the future generation, and I think that she uh, is wonderful at reading EEGs and doing them as well. Next slide, please. And then when LAU bought Trizzle, I uh, followed suit with LAU. I had been hired to, to uh, I have been asked to, to join LAU even before they hired, they hired, I mean, they bought Trizzle, and I was gonna do it because I wanted, you know, to go back to a full academic position. And uh, this is where I became a uh, full-blown uh, tenure-track prof professor of neurology. And I had developed neurology with LAU from scratch as well. I, I wrote all of the neuroscience module uh, for the MET2. And then we created the neurology scholarship for the MET3 and then the neurology residency program. And then I became assistant dean for research and chair of neurology. We changed it from a division to a department. And this is uh, where I also trained 16 neurology residents, uh, 12 graduated from the uh, uh, LU, uh, Lebanese University and the LAU programs. Next slide, please. And I need uh, your permission to introduce my partners in SIN. Uh, uh, 
two of them on the left hand side of your screen uh, first and foremost dr rishdi ahtab who uh, was my student in neurology and who then uh, went to france and got his phd and his two fellowships and came back to work with me and became my partner at work at lau for 10 years or so and dr samar ayash who also graduated from the lebanese university and followed suit she followed rishdi into his track and she remained in France, and now she is uh, an associate professor of neurology, soon to become a professor. She has the number of publications, uh, that's for sure, to be able to do it, uh, at uh, Créteil uh, en Limondor. And um, from the uh, LAU people, uh, our first graduating uh, resident uh, is Madiha Shatila, who is now uh, doing an MS uh, fellowship in London, England. Uh, and then... Uh, Jumana Freyha and Karim Makhoul on the right hand side of the screen and the middle picture is one that uh, I took with the team before I left uh, to go to Abu Dhabi and you can see on it uh, Wissam Yama who was one of the residents who graduated from our program at the Lebanese University that came back to work with us Nancy Malouf that uh, started as a resident with us and then went to the US and worked with my boss, Sami Hari, graduated and came back to work with us again. Huda and Fadi are, are my EEG tech. Huda is on my uh, right hand side in the picture. Uh, I owe her a lot. She's done, she's ran the, the neurophysiology lab for me. And I couldn't have possibly done it without these people. I mean, I, I, I have to tell you that no, no one can reach uh, anything or, or get to anything that they, if they don't build a team. And, and uh, I think that uh, my forte or what I was uh, able to do well is to build a team. I started as a solo practitioner at the hospital. And when I left, we were uh, three full-timers and five part-timers working with me as far as attendings are concerned. And we had... Uh, uh, seven, eight residents in the program. So to, to do that, you really have to, to understand people and to, and to help them uh, and, and they will help you in, in return. Otherwise, it will not work. So this is word of advice for all of you. Grow, you, you will grow when you help the people that are around you grow. And I was criticized when I took Rishdi as my associate. He was just fresh out of training and I I went to the CEO of the hospital and I told him this is the deal I want with him. And he says, you're crazy. You're giving him half of your practice. You're giving EMGs. You're giving him all of that. And said, I'm not here to ask your opinion. I'm here to tell you that this is what we're going to be doing and to get it notified that this is how it's going to run. And you don't, if you don't see where I want to, to, to go, then you, you don't know me yet. And then this is how we were able to create a department of neurology. And and change it from a division and and grow a residency program which was really one of the best and i'm i say this very proudly uh, my residents used to score on the right exam which is given all over the world for neurology residents both in the us and abroad they used to score but between 92 to 98 percentile and so we were very very happy with that and hopefully things will continue to go as well for them and now that i'm gone Next slide, please. So how did, I, that did my research accompany the innovations that were, that were happening in the different fields of neurology? Well, you know that headache, in headache migraine is an extremely debilitating condition. And uh, we had nothing to offer these patients before the first trip then hit the market. And this was during the, in the middle of my residency in neurology. Since then, we have had new triptans that have become, become available. Then they have replaced the ergots that were the old way to treat uh, this, these uh, headaches, but they, were, they had severe side effects associated with them. And then people started playing with the idea of transcranial magne magnetic stimulation. The FDA approved the first one in 2013. They're, they were supposed to be made for home use, and you can see some of them on the right hand side of, of your screen and then botox got approved as well uh, for uh, prevention of chronic migraine and you can see the protocol used in botox on your on the left hand side of your screen next slide please 
and then lately we have the CGRPs, monoclonal antibodies, which have revolutionized uh, the treatment of migraine. I mean, one injection a month and the patient is almost pain-free for, for a whole month, or if they still have headaches, the severity, the frequency, uh, the duration decreases a lot, and they start responding to a Panadol tablet, which was really, I mean, unheard of in these patients before. And we also have the DITANs, which as the selective serotonin receptor agonist, one of them is Las Meditant, that was approved by FDA in 2019. We have several uh, CGRPs, galcanezumab, femanezumab, etinezumab, etc., that are uh, available for use as well. Next slide, please. So, Publications that we were uh, lucky enough to be able to, to publish in that, in that uh, perspective. We worked on um, vitamin K2 status and arterial stiffness in migraine untreated patients. We worked on transcranial direct current simulation because uh, Dr. Ahdab richly had trained in, in this during his training in, in France and he, he brought back the know-how to, to RISA when he came back, to LAU when he came back. And so we published two papers, one in uh, episodic migraine and one is over in uh, medication overuse. Both of them gave positive results. So hopefully uh, the company will take this further to develop a device that will help as a home device. I was part of a uh, huge study uh, as well uh, uh, using uh, Erenumab uh, and it's called the Empower study. It was published in Cephalalgia in June, 2021. And I was the highest recruiter of the of the Middle East, so this is why my paper is the only persons uh, from the Middle East on the on the publication. And uh, we hired six, sixty patients from from this. And when they came to me and they asked me for twenty, I said, "Okay, I'll do it." And then I I told them, "But I will not start recruiting before three months from now, which is two months before the deadline, because I have things to finish. So I will not." And so they were becoming anxious and they get to me and they say, well, the other centers recruited this and that. And I said, I told you from the beginning that I will start recruiting three months from the from when you talk to me. And then in two weeks, we had recruited the 20 patients. I had a, a huge population of migraine headache in my, among my, my patients. So when I started with the project, we were done in, in two weeks. They came back and they, this, this is on deal and said, hey, Come and audit us anytime you want. The records are here. You can make sure that everything is done. It's kosher. It's, we don't fabricate data. I mean, we don't do that. And 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 please don't do that because you would not only ruin your reputation, you would ruin science as a whole. And it's not, it's, I mean, don't do that. That's all I'm going to say about it. And, and they said, can you recruit more? And I said, how much more? You want 20 more? And they said, could you? And I said, sure. So two weeks later, we had done the other 20, and they came back and said, Dr. Yeshe, this is unreal. And can you do more? And I said, another 20? And they said, sure, if you can. And we hired 20 more. And I said, you know what? I could have, uh, hire 100 more, but we're not going to do it. Enough. We hired 60 patients. Now we want our name on the publication. And this is how we got it done. Next, please. Stroke. In Arabic, there is a say that's used to say failish mat ailish. So stroke, don't even attempt to treat. And this is how it was when I first got into neurology. And since then, we have IVTPA, we have the endovascular stuff, we have the, the thrombectomy, we have uh, the stent, uh, the, the, the dual, uh, uh, what they call it, retriever. I mean, we have plenty of devices that were tried and now all it boils down to is how fast can you be i mean can you beat the clock if you can beat the clock you can save a patient with stroke because time is brain i mean if you're gonna wait if you pass the crucial windows that are set to you you're not going to be able to treat stroke stroke but if you don't if you do it quickly enough and if you're part of a stroke center that can do it then you will save lives and you will save functionality, and you will offer these patients the, the these patients the quality of life they deserve. And we we were we I was involved as I told you with, with this when I was still a resident. We were doing intracarotid TPA injections, not just the intravenous uh, TPA. Uh, so I, this is a, a topic that's very dear to my heart. Even though I'm not doing a lot of stroke uh, now, I've uh, oriented my career towards other fields. Next slide, please. So 
what you can develop using the stroke uh, uh, DWIPI mismatch are computer uh, devices that would tell you whether it's worth it's still worth it to inject these people with TPA or not. Because if the core of the stroke is everything there is to it, then you're not going to give them TPA because it would increase the risk and there will be no benefit. However, is the penumbra, which is the area of around, uh, of the brain that is around the core of the stroke and that is very highly susceptible. If you reperfuse it, you could save it. If it doesn't get enough perfusion, it will die and that will lead to an extension of the stroke. So if the penumbra is large enough, then you should go ahead and inject these patients. And we were lucky enough to have one of those programs at RISA before I left, uh, or LAU, to, uh, to be able to uh, do the calculations uh, right away. I mean, you would, you would do the CT, CTA, and then you'd, you would get your, uh, your, uh, your matching point. And if you were lucky enough to be able to do an MRI, then that, this would be even better. So, but the thing is that you have to treat, treat stroke before the four hours window to get the best result. It can be extended up to six hour. Thrombectomy can go up to 24 hours, but the faster you do it, the best results are gonna be obtained with that. Next slide, please. So spot a stroke versus do not treat a stroke, and this is the, uh, the what we can do. Uh, so be fast is balance, eyes, face, arms, speech, time. This is what you do for a quick exam a quick evaluation of the patient and then on the right hand is uh, the thrombectomy the catheter that can is, uh, aspire the the thrombus or the mechanical thrombectomy as is shown down with the clot uh, stuck into the mesh of the uh, neuroradiologist next slide please what about ms again when i was a medical student they would tell us if the patient presents with their first MS attack, don't do anything. Why is that? Because all we had to offer these patients was steroids to treat the acute attack. We had nothing to offer them that would modify the course of the disease or help us prevent further attacks from occurring. So we would wait for the patient to declare themselves. They would also tell us that uh, MS patients do not have pain. They would tell us that MS patients had no cognition involvement. They would tell us a lot of things that it was axonal involvement was uh, only seen at the very late stage of the disease where patients would be burned out. And we have learned that all of this was a bunch of crap and that it was not true. And now we go the exact reverse way. We go for an early diagnosis. We know that cognitive impairment involves about 50% of the patient, and that is early on before they've developed any sign of physical disease. We know that axonal involvement is involved early on, and the more axonal involvement there is, the more disability the patient is likely to get. And we know now we are debating between two different types of tra treatment, escalation versus aggressive treatment from the very beginning. And we now know that it is safe to give these patients medication during their pregnancy and during their breastfeeding. So, I mean, the whole concept of multiple sclerosis has gone the on entire reverse way from the, uh, the, than what it was used to be when I was a medical student. Next slide, please. So now we have all of these medications that were developed over the years. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you, can, you are seeing them classified by efficacy and safety. So the more efficacious and the more safe ones you're going to notice uh, are uh, uh, going to be uh, as depicted on your, uh, on your uh, screen. Okay, next slide. So what have we been able to contribute in uh, multiple sclerosis as far as the research is concerned? Uh, well, I, I imagine this study about fampridine in patients with multiple sclerosis and gait impairment. And uh, we looked at cortical excitability because, you know, as, as you might know, lately my research has, has gone towards neuromodula neuromodulation, neurostimulation, all of that. 
So we tried cortical excitability measures that may predict the response to famfetine, which is an add-on medication that you give to patients that have MS and gait impairment. It will work on the gait, no matter what is their primary treatment. So they could be treated with an interferon or with any of the other new ones. You can add to the famfetine to that if they have gait impairment and they should improve. And we wanted to predict what patients will improve because about 50% of the patients improve, 50% do not respond. And so I got Biogen either to give me a grant to sponsor this study and we were able to run it. It was uh, just sponsored by them, but we've, we've run the whole thing. The patient, uh, they did not interfere with how we conducted. It was a primary investigator initiated study. And then Dr. Samar Ayash, uh, our partner in, in France, uh, also got us involved with the uh, transcranial direct current simulation on hand dexterity in multiple scler sclerosis. And then we looked at tremor as well. Uh, and then we looked at uh, paroxysmal symptoms in MS. And uh, I've worked also with a bunch of uh, people among the Middle East on um, a fingoli mod uh, in relapsing limiting MS. And we have three more publications on the way, hopefully soon. Next, please. What about dementia? I mean, again, uh, this is one very hot topic. And now we are uh, uh, lucky enough to have some medications that at least are affecting the progress of the disease, if not more. But we lately have uh, uh, aducanumab that has received the approval of the FDA that promises to be uh, hopefully very uh, helpful once the saga of the side effects will be uh, sorted out. But uh, it works by sucking out the protein plaques from the brain it takes them away. So if you have somebody with early stage dementia, you could stop the disease completely. You could stop progression from a state of mild cognitive impairment to dementia, which is huge. I mean, you would you would make a person just a bit forgetful instead of becoming demented. I mean, if I, I don't know if if you understand the impact that this would have on on patients' lives. So we have a lot of medications. The uh, the um, Choline acylase inhibitors and memantine that are used for the treatment of these patients. They come in different formulations to try to, to, try to avoid side effect. Now, where rivastigmine comes in patch because when they take a PO, they're very nauseous and uh, very few of them can tolerate the high doses that are required for this patient to, uh, for this drug to become efficacious. So we are doing a lot of work in this field as well. Next slide, please. Movement disorders. And we have had quite a few advances in our understanding of the underlying biology of movement disorders through genetics, as I've mentioned before, and through hopefully biomarkers and imaging. Unfortunately, the stem cell implants that were done early on uh, during the century on uh, Parkinson's disease have been very disappointing. But now we've had some excellent results with the deep brain stimulation and serotaxic surgery. Hiba, can you please uh, press the video? And this is a patient, Parkinsonian, before and after the brain stimulation. You're going to see finger to nose, which is a test that we use a lot. And you, I don't know if you can appreciate it, but his hand is shaking so much on the other side. And this is his gait. Okay. Next slide, please. So excellent results that we are obtaining with that. And we are using uh, also a bunch of um, other uh, studies on, on compounds that are being used to treat all of these different uh, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, tardif dyskinesias, and Huntington's disease, and sialuria in patients. So we have all of these treatment options now that have become available over the course of the past 10, 15 years. Next slide, please. So the most important uh, uh, development in movement disorder has been, as we've mentioned, the stereotaxic surgery and the neuromodulation with the deep brain stimulation where we can now treat tremor, we can treat dystonia, we can treat uh, uh, tremor-dominant Parkinson's diseases that are medication refractory by thalamotomy or by stimulation of the ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus uh, and so on and so forth i'm not going to get too technical because this would be beyond the scope of this lecture next slide please what about epilepsy well 
as I've shown you, when I started my epilepsy training, we were just getting fresh. We had, you know, the, the, the dinosaurs of uh, anti-epileptic medication, phenytoin, phenobar, tegretol, and uh, valproic acid, uh, uh, depakine, were available when I was a medical student. And then we had nothing for a number of years. And then all of a sudden, the surge that you can see on, your, on the left-hand side of your slide, all of these medications that become, uh, became available, uh, uh, and it was unbelievable. Uh, it happened in the 1990s, so right during my residency and my, and my fellowship in epilepsy. And uh, we have now a multitude of uh, anti-epileptic uh, medication to pick from for, for the treatment of epilepsy. And this is still important because, you know, 70% of the epilepsy patients respond to the first medication you're going to give them if the diagnosis is done properly and if you have hit the right type of epilepsy. Next slide, please. So epilepsy surgery dates back to ancient Egypt. But the modern age is uh, uh, believed to be uh, uh, done by Sir Victor Horsley, who performed surgical treatment for epilepsy in London in 1886. And then Fedor Krauss initiated surgery for epilepsy in Germany at about the same time. And it became apparent for that for it to become a success, there should be a collaboration between neurologists and neurosurgeons that would be indispensable and I can tell you Hewling Jackson, Hewlings and Jackson in UK, Herman and Oppenheim in Germany were the teams that were best known. Next slide. But modern day uh, uh, epilepsy is known to be made by Jasper and Penfield in the Montreal Neurological Institute uh, uh, during the early phases of the last century, where they really described the whole homunculus uh, because they did a lot of uh, uh, invasive monitoring on the patients and they implanted the, plan, the, the, the plates and they were able to use the plates to stimulate the patient's brain and to know the function of each area. And so they were able to produce this map of the brain called the homunculus that you can see in the center of the, of the uh, slide. Uh, also, one major, major advance was that you were able to do these surgeries under local anesthesia in patients with epilepsy. So we put the patient in the deep anesthesia, we do the craniotomy, and then we open, uh, and then we wake the patient up and we do the surgeries awake. Because in the brain, there is no pain receptors. The pain receptors are in the meninges, so in the covering of the brain and around the blood vessels. So if we're not simulating a blood vessel and we've already gotten the meninges open to be able to access, we are home free and we can do these surgeries awake. And this is extremely important because you can now, uh, next slide please, you can uh, do these uh, surgeries and be able to avoid uh, um, disrupting uh, uh, important functional areas. So I remember, when I, asked, when I was at the clinic, we did what we called a musical uh, 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 WADA test and then a musical surgery on this person who had epilepsy and who was a violinist at the Cleveland uh, uh, Orchestra. And we were able to salvage her, her, uh, her uh, I mean, her, the areas that were uh, uh, involved. And back home, I was able to carry on a, a number of these surgeries awake with Dr. Comer we've done central epilepsy surgery, which is very important because you're working just within the, the motor homunculus. So if you have a dysplasia here, it's there, it's important to remove the dysplasia only and to keep the rest of the brain intact. And so we were able to do this by doing epilepsy surgery and by working together. And so I would be with the, the surgeon in the operating theater and I would simulate the patient while the while the uh, physician would be, uh, the neurosurgeon would be operating, and at the end, I would use uh, uh, intra-operative uh, 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 recordings to be able to tell if we took away the complete uh, zone or not, and and I was able to provide the service to the, to the neurosurgeons. Next slide, please. And then there was this dramatic. Uh, explosion that occurred in Beirut on August 4, 2020, 
after which I had to leave the country and I relocated to go to Abu Dhabi. And I left behind me, as Hiba mentioned, 24,000 patients. And I'm, to this day, uh, I have uh, some remorse going on. I have remorse mostly towards my residents because they got into the program because I was part of the program. And then um, I thought I was leaving them in good hands because I would leave the department under the direction of Dr. Ahdab, who was supposed to stay. But six months after I left, he said that he could not, he could not stay there without, uh, uh, without me. And he left as well. He, he went to Qatar. So um, I have a little bit of a um, sore uh, taste in my mind, in my uh, palate, when I think of these days and when I think of... Uh, uh, what we had as a vision for for the department, for the hospital, for the university, and for the country, and hopefully one day we'll be able to uh, resume uh, working there. Next slide, please. And since then, I am uh, at Sheikh Shahboot Medical City. I picked that place because they want to make it the Mayo Clinic destination outside of the U.S., so there is a lot of work that is being done to ameliorate the teaching, the research, you know, the Cleveland, the, the Mayo Clinic has three plates, clinical, teaching, and research. So in order for us to become a, clean, uh, a Mayo Clinic destination, we have to work on the three plates, and we are doing that. And so I'm a senior consultant at uh, the hospital, and I'm also a faculty member, professor of neurology at Khalifa University. Um, I'm the Assistant Dean for Clinical Affairs and the Neurology Clerkship Coordinator for the uh, Khalifa Medical 3 students. Uh, at the hospital, we are seven consultants, soon to, soon to become eight. Uh, I'm building an epilepsy program there, and we're building together with Dr. Ahmed Shatila, a multiple sclerosis center. We're starting a neurology residency. We got the approvals. We got the, uh, you know, the... Um, uh, all the clearances, and so this September we will have uh, four new residents, two PGY2s and two PGY1s. And so uh, I'm also in charge of doing a program called Humanities in Medicine, and I'm starting to develop clinical research into the department. Next slide, please. So the future of my research will be in neuromodulation. We've already published some uh, data on this with the, the pain-reducing properties of the Molly suit. But I would like to show you this video, please, uh, Hiba. And so this suit is a jacket and a pant, and this patient had multiple sclerosis. It's a funny story. This guy is a Lebanese who lived in Abu Dhabi. He used to come to see me in Lebanon when I was there. And the, the screen on the left and the middle side of the, the slide show him before stimulation and one hour after stimulation that I had done for him at the Hotel Gabriel, which is close to the university where he was uh, staying for the time. And then his wife measured the distance and in his wife in Abu Dhabi took this one month later after he started combining the suit with some physical therapy. And you can tell from the video that he's much faster. And then even one hour after the stimulation, he lifts his leg better. He he reaches there faster, etc., and he's done so well. And so I'm going to be using uh, this suit. Uh, I, I, I became uh, a member of the scientific committee of the company that creates this suit, a Swedish company. Next slide, please. And so what we will have now, no, next slide. And so we have five uh, phase three studies that I've applied for for IRB and that are going to be fully funded. We hope to start recruitment next month. And they are going to deal in oxygenation in multiple sclerosis when using this suit, spasticity in multiple sclerosis, stroke, and the improvement that we could see in spasticity of stroke, fibromyalgia, and the decrease of pain and back pain that we're going to do together with the Mayo Clinic uh, Arizona. So as you can tell, research has been and will always be extremely important in my life and in my career. I cannot imagine doing medicine without research. I mean, it would be like I'm missing part of me because it's... Uh, and teaching is another is another thing. So um, I, I have developed the clerkship for my three students. Khalifa University is an interesting university. They were very well known as far as engineering is concerned, but their medical school is pretty fresh. 
we are going to graduate the first batch at the end of this academic year. So they remind me a little bit of what I have been through with LAU, that were again a fresh, brand new school of medicine. They are the first school of medicine in the Gulf that uses the American system, because otherwise, uh, up to this time, it was more more so the British system or other systems. So four years of pre-med, uh, if you're getting there at the freshman level, and four years of medicine. And so I have a little bit of a déjà vu, déjà vécu experience uh, going through all of this, because I've already done it for, for LAU, and hopefully I will be able to replicate it here, but we have much more support, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to take it one step further. So I would hope that uh, this lecture has shown you that you can do research even when you are in a private hospital with almost no resources. I had no resources whatsoever to speak of. I had to create the system. I had to come up with the ideas. And this is when I started orienting my research towards clinical because I was not going to open a lab, obviously. It would have cost millions, and I don't know where I would have gotten them from. So I started saying, hmm, these questions are begging for an answer. So why don't we try to do a little project with this and a little project with that? And this is why, if you look at my publications, they will go from all over the place, uh, some on headaches, some others on MS, some others on on uh, stroke, uh, etc. And then finally, I found the common link. And this is neuromodulation and neurostimulation because I could use it in all of these fields. And this is going to be what I'm going to develop further uh, as time goes by. And it would be nice to have devices that are not pharmaco-based, uh, so no side effects, hopefully, or very little of them, to be able to treat some of these horrid conditions that we still have. Next slide. So I hope I didn't bore you too much with this presentation. And I'm going to finish by tell you, give you another uh, word of, of, of advice, if I may. And that is to cultivate your hobbies. Start working on your hobbies now, because there is nothing worse than a bank employee or a doctor that retires and finds out that their life is over, because they have nothing else that they are interested in or nothing else that they want to do. And the ones of you who know me well know that I love to cook, I love to travel, and I collect arts. And so this is one of my art uh, collection. It's a huge watercolor that was done by an artist friend of mine in Bangkok, very well known for this uh, masterful uh, art. And it is showing people sitting at a cafe. This could be anywhere in the world. And I hope that you're going to take time for yourself, time for your families. Don't let your work absorb you 100% of your time. You need to be able to devote time to the ones that are dear and near to you as well. And you need to find some time to enjoy your hobbies, keep your batteries charged and uh, your bubble of oxygen filled. And with that, I'm going to end. And I'm going to thank you all very, very much for putting up with me during this talk. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Dr. Naji. That was truly inspirational. Thank you for giving us a glimpse of several milestones in your career and you know incredible mentors that helped shape your life. And from that, how you went on to act as a great leader and a mentor yourself. Uh, I personally hope that I seek out a mentor great as you. We will be discussing a few questions from the audience now. Uh, to be respectful of everybody's time, we're just going to discuss two questions from the audience. Uh, so the first question is, if you have to give an advice to your younger self about how to go through medical school and survive medical school, what would it be? Uh, it's a tough question because when I went through medical school, it was the war in Lebanon. You know, and we were crossing through town and we had a very difficult time reaching there and we had to live in a laboratory to be able to complete our year and with that we enjoyed it because we were a very solid team i mean we we all felt that we would stand up for each other and uh, there was no bickering and there was no and we didn't care who would get a higher grade and we would all support each other and we would do it together as a community and that helped us survive some very, very difficult time. And uh, I'm going to be very honest with you. At the end of my med two, I was going to stop and go do something else. So I went and saw my advisor 
Dr. Joe Saran at the time, and I told him, you know, I'm getting bored to death with this. This is not why I picked medicine. I've been five years into this, three years of BS in biology and two years in, in Med 1 and Med 2, and I have not seen a patient yet. And and I'm I'm really tired of this. And, and it became, I mean, obvious on my grades because I was just not studying or doing enough to pass. And I, I, I was not motivated anymore. And he said, are you crazy? You've spent five years. Give me, finish this year. You still have two months to go. And I'm sure that when you get to Met 3, you will just love it because you're very clinically oriented. And I was, he was correct. And so when I get to Met 3 and Met 4, I was just like a fish in water. I, I loved it. I, no matter how hard it was, when I had patients to talk to, and you know communication skills i mean it, it goes back to that when i had patients to talk to i was happy and i was it's very funny but uh, very early on i must have had uh, a sign on my head that said give it to me so people would come and would tell me stories that i found was unreal how much they would confide in you that was very private uh, and and that kept me going with time and I thrive on the patient-doctor relationship and contact. And I really am applying what Foley, Darov, Harik have taught me, which is be, pa be patient-centered and not be disease-centered, and try to help people as much as you can, even when, when, when their disease is, is still not manageable and, and treatable. So this is how i've done it i don't know how you guys would do it because things have changed a lot since and you have much more i mean when i look at the medical student now they are exposed to, to patients from the first year they have all of these clinical cases they have the simulation sessions they have the visits to the hospital so uh, I, I think that uh, compared to us you were spoiled but we still were very happy because we were uh, we were uh, not individualistic into because of the war and because of everything else that went on we were very much taking this as a community and and that helped us to survive and i hope that you will be able to enjoy it because you should it's not uh, it's not an ordeal uh, it's 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 an experience that will grow with you and then that will make you uh, grow further and become uh, much more of a person than you already are Thank you for that, doctor. So we have one last question. Uh, I think it's a very important question. We have a lot of attendees here that are medical students and are trying to get into research. And it's always a bit overwhelming and confusing getting into research as students in medical school. Uh, the question here is what advice would you have for new researchers? People that graduate from medical school and want to do into, into research or people that want to do research when they are medical students? Yeah. When Sorry? When they're medical students, well, it's tough. You know, I I used to say that I would not accept uh, a medical student into my research program during their first two years because they are way above their heads with things to do. And then I discovered that some of them will manage. And if we give them a case report or a bunch of case reports or something that they create that we help them de develop, they might be able to get it uh, to 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 to. Uh, completion but you have to be extremely careful in selecting these topics if you're going to select a topic where recruitment will take forever and they're going to be with you for a couple of months then obviously they're not going to benefit from this study and their input and what they're going to take home from it is not going to be uh, good for them so i think it will be very important as a medical student to pick a topic that is easily applicable and and that you can finish in the timeline that you've had or pick something that you're going to develop further and work more upon when you graduate then th that would be the key to success otherwise i would not recommend that that you guys start doing research very early on you can do easy tasks sure but i mean big project if you're not going to follow up on them you're going to get burned and you're going to end up not liking the experience and that would be a pity because Research can be a lot of fun, but it has to take its course. It has to take its time. You have to know the system. You have to, I mean, you just cannot do research if you if you have not been initiated. And this is why I'm tilting my hat to Greg and his team for all the efforts that they are doing to make research much more easy and palatable to you. I'm telling you, when I went 
I graduated, I got my MD, and I went into this research thing because I felt that this was lacking in my training. I had no clue what research was. And the first six months that I spent, I spent reading about projects, about techniques, about how this is getting done, about what has been published, about to be able to build myself my own library, because at the time we did not have the net. Every time we needed to get an article out, we would have to go to the library, spend few hours to get the references uh, back home to be able to get them. Now a day, things have become so much more easy. I mean, you Google uh, whatever it is, and tube, you have the list that is very comprehensive of everything you need, and images and videos, and and so it is much more easy to do it now. But yet, with that, I would recommend getting the structure in place before you start don't jump in without any uh, because you're gonna you're gonna get burned and and that would be again as i said that would be a pity thank you dr naji uh, i guess dr gregory has a question for you as well yeah i wanted to keep the the last it's a comments first and uh, it's a, it's more of a question first dr yish it's, it's an amazing presentation from the start to the end it's in one hour and 30 minutes and i listened to every slide and line you said from your mentors to your publications to the future and every time i think okay i'm gonna i'm gonna like little my focus you throw in a bomb which is more interesting about the suit about about where you jump from each one and your career has shifted so much from so many countries and you and it's funny one of the things you did not mention in the slide which i am witness to it's how many people you influence in med school so many people did neurology because of Dr. Yeshe. And it, one of them is one of my closest friends, is Adam, who is with us in Intersect. He chose his path in neurology when the first day he met Dr. Yeshe, he saw him and he said, that is an amazing physician. I think I want to do neurology. And he was one year younger than me. I was his resident. So he, when he said that, no, man, neurology is so difficult. I never had the idea of neurology because for me, your, your, neurology is for the elite. The smartest people in in the room those are the people the black uh, box that no one yeah. wants to tackle <laughs> yeah exactly and uh, it's it's so funny and every uh, he influenced so many people in neurology in in turn and medicine and i saw the names he published with and it's so many people that i know and influenced them to get the field and, uh, and to get the position in the states and funny. outside funny. so many people had. Dr. Ahdab wanted to become a nephrologist before we met. Uh, Dr. Ayash wanted to become a hematology oncology before we met. And then Adam, Adam wanted surgery. Adam wanted surgery, I know. But I mean, it's, um, you know, when you do it, uh, I, I don't want to sound patronizing, but when you do it right, uh, you, you will start making mistakes in neurology when you don't take time. You have to allocate time to the patient to get a good history because in, in neurology the findings the exam will not tell you anything if you don't have the good history to back it up and there is an art to it and when you when when i'm teaching that to medical students or to residents later on i am really pushing them very hard until they acquire the technique and and, and some of them just you know I'm, I'm, they're getting i know that they're getting frustrated and tired with me but then after going through it a, a number of times it sinks in and they understand where i'm i'm leading them and i think that this process when you when you when you start to uh, really um, um understand the the backbone of it you you can fall in love with neurology or we can you can say that's not for me at all i mean but i can understand why somebody who's not sure of of a career or who thinks they have an interest in in something might change to come to neurology after they've undergone this process which i did not invent i mean as i told you it has been uh, 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 gone uh, i mean taught from resident to resident through through the years now but um, i'm gonna mention this comes to the second thing that i wanted to comment is you get when, when dr yesha says when the history taking is very important but he didn't say how he does it you, it's like all of us everybody who graduated from lu knows his clinic ever you go in through the door you sit on the left side you wait for the patient to talk then he asks the question 
when the patient, there, there comes the examination. They go to, the, I will never forget this. It's the system. They go to the, to the in front, there was the mirror on the, on the, the wall and there was the, the, where they stand so that he does the neurologic exam. And then we move to the other side while he does this. And it's a repetition, it's the system. So he, 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 he did his own research for his own time saving. He has 24,000 patients, you have to imagine that. So he has to have a way, look, I, I think things differently. So he has to have, uh, minimize time in certain things, which is a repetition, so that he can actually think about the diagnosis. So these are the history taking, which I learned a lot from, but I took that in my surgical parts. So when I, when I try to do the same surgery, I always try to find the minimum amount of time. So it doesn't matter if you like neurology or not. You, you respect the system that he actually created for himself. And it's funny, this, what I'm talking about, is six years ago, and I still remember it to today. It's something about his clinic. I will always remember it because it's something very, very, you always take something from certain physicians. And so one of the things that I took and I applied it. It's something that people with a research mentality really appreciate. I used to love research. And I used to consider Dr. Yesh as the elite of the research because he's the only one who had the found, uh, funds sponsoring for research of all the attendings. So, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and you respect people who did research because they do that. They study their own method. We have to, to make our methods simpler, safer, and even easier to, to teach. So it's something that I wanted really to comment and to give that. It's not in the presentation, but it's something I really admire since when I was a medical student. If you're not systematic, you cannot be a good neurologist. I think for you to be a good neurologist, you have to have a systematic approach. Otherwise, if you start getting you know, uh, lost into the details, you will really lose it and you will not be able to sort the problems out or to configure the solution for the patients. So neurology, it is extremely systematic from the beginning until the very end. And when you're not that, then you're, I, I, you know, some people are not built to become neurologists. I, I tell them that, I mean, some people come to me and they say, what about neurology for us? And I said, well, you know, I, I have, uh, you will be a, a good neurologist, but you will, you will probably have a difficult time excelling in this field. You're, you're more meant to be this, this and that, other, other fellowships, because you're more a dissertation kind of guy than a structured kind of guy. And that's for sure. I mean, what Greg said about the system, uh, uh, I fully uh, adhere to because, you know, I had to be organized and I had to have a system in order for me, you know, LAU was hard because I had 24,000 patients, but I had no administrator. I was handling the 24,000 patients by myself with secretaries that I used to share with four or five other physicians. So you can imagine the load uh, uh, that this would, and then with that we were teaching and with that we were doing research. So, and then with that I had some administrative th things to take care of for the department, for the assistant dean position, etc. So there was a lot of, things that I was doing at the same time and I was at this, you know enjoying time with my family and uh, and vacation time with the kids and all of that so you have to have a structure built before you can you can in embark into something like this otherwise it's not going to work and uh, just lastly before peter uh, ends this I want to thank you, doctor, for a lot of things that you have done and influenced us. And you always kept in touch with all of us. So I want to thank you a lot. And uh, it's my honor that I learned from you. Well, that's my privilege to stay in touch with all of you. And uh, it, it really uh, makes me extremely happy that I'm still able to contribute uh, a tiny bit to the huge uh, amount uh, that you are producing in this field. And uh, Hey, you feel free to call me anytime, you know that. And uh, hopefully uh, you will uh, keep driving this further. I think it's, it's, it's amazing what you've done so far. And I know that uh, this is going to grow mo much more because you, you are a team person. You have your teams around you. You have people that you're delegating to, to each one uh, something to do because you cannot run it by yourself and you're smart enough to know it, Greg. And, uh, I have to uh, uh, give you credit for that and uh, hopefully uh, 
uh, things will keep on going as well as they have been over the past few years for all of you. Good luck, guys. I really mean it. Thank you. So much, doctor. And uh, I don't know if Peter said we had uh, 240 people watching us today. So it's a really good number. I hope all of them actually got influenced by this on the website and on the live event on the website. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. It has been my honor and my privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naji. Your talk was highly intellectual and certainly inspirational. I know we caught you between flights, so thank you for being here. I'm sure that your words of encouragement and guidance were well received by all in attendance. Uh, furthermore, thank you for your valuable time and effort to make this webinar possible. Uh, we actually have 300 attendees that have joined across YouTube and the RGCR website. Uh, to everyone in the audience that has joined us today, we sincerely apologize for the technical difficulties that were caused uh, in the delay of the webinar. Uh, thank you all for taking your time uh, so we can be synonymously present here. I hope you leave this webinar full of inspiration and a new morale. On behalf of the whole IGCR team, we wish you well and hope to see you next time with yet another Pioneers in Medicine webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you.